So I had to choose spiritual or clinical, and that's after 11 years in school, right? So that was really difficult. And that was a few months of, of I guess, soul weighing. And I decided there's nothing that I would do that would make me happier than follow that spiritual path. My personality, everything that I'm about, it requires openness and exploration and newness. And the clinical field was closed and was, yeah, closed is really the best way of putting it. So not only they rejected me with my spirituality, which was true, many of my colleagues did not respect me if that's what I was into, but the field as a whole was not willing to accept the reality of consciousness and of spirituality. Welcome in. Gosh, I am so excited for this interview today. This is someone I stumbled upon and I was so delighted with the whole thing. And I, I contacted her right away and I said, please come on the show. So it's a good interview today. I'm excited to get started. If you're interested in this kind of content, I hope you'll click that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. And if you want to stay up top of what's going on on the planet, and I know it's really crazy right now, you might want to sign up for a Friday morning email newsletter. It comes out every Friday morning. I try to capture all the things that I think are important going on around the planet. It's very short, very sweet, very free. If you're interested, you can just click the link in the description box down below and it will land in your inbox on Friday mornings. In today's toxic world, taking care of our health is more important than ever. One of the natural solutions I've integrated into my routine is the benefit of mushrooms. And the go-to place for me is Birch Boys. They are without a doubt one of the greatest resources for mushroom products on the planet. Made in the USA, sustainably sourced, and run by an absolute wonderful entrepreneur, Birch Voice has become my go-to for natural health solutions. While they have a wide variety of mushroom products, the two that I use every day are right here. First, I use the Chaga Now, which is a wonderful mixture that I put a tiny little scoop in my morning coffee to support my immune system. Chaga is one of the most effective immune support compounds on the planet, and this is a super way to get it into your daily diet in an easy to use formula and very, very effective for immune system support. And if you're looking for clear thinking, <laughs> I can tell you, you'll be surprised at the effects of lion's mane. I use this lion's mane tincture one teaspoon every single morning, and the difference in the clarity of my thinking is extraordinary. I was actually really, really surprised. Birch Boys has a whole lineup of mushroom tinctures. Make sure you check them out when you're on the website, but I'll tell you what, these are my two favorite and I use them every single day. They are absolutely a quality company built on integrity. Go to birchboys.com and use the code NEWEARTH for 20% off your entire order. Birch Boys mushroom products, I think you're going to love it. And with that, I would like to welcome in Dr. Yafi Yair. Welcome. How are you today? Hi, Kimberly. I'm wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I have to say, I stumbled upon your channel on YouTube and you were channeling a fairy. And the I was so the fairy. The fairy. <laughs> and I was so delighted about that because I don't feel like we give enough time to the elementals and the fairies that are coexisting on the planet. And it was lovely to see someone connecting with that energy. So that's really why I wanted to talk with you because I wanted to learn more. But back us up a little bit and let us know when did this all happen for you kind of take us through the story okay yeah so it's a long story <laughs> we can go into it and make it as long or as short as we choose and so my whole life i was playing with that left brain right brain creative intuitive side and more logical scientific side really since i was i think a baby as 
far back as I can remember. And my whole life I had periods where I was leaning towards one way or another. And then I was doing my doctorate in clinical psychology, which is obviously very left brain, very scientific oriented. And from there in 2012, my latest big spiritual awakening happened. And I was in the midst of doing my doctorate program. So it was really, my brain was confused <laughs> with everything that was happening and all the expansion that was happening so quickly. Okay. So when you say your latest spiritual awakening, it sounds like it was profound. Can you give us some details on that? Was it a Kundalini experience, a partial Kundalini awakening? How do you, how would you describe that? Yeah. So from my perspective, my Yafi physical person perspective, it really started with my interest growing. All of a sudden I became not obsessed, but extremely passionate about anything spiritual and paranormal. I was interested in reading books about it. I started listening to the overnight um, radio show, Coast to Coast AM, which covers a wide variety of paranormal topics. Me and my husband all of a sudden became interested and dove into this rabbit hole. And as I said, I started reading books and it was just, just an awakening. And then a few months probably into my awakening, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and within two months transitioned. And that, did a few things for me. One, it awakened my intuition like never before. And two, it piqued my interest. My interest was no longer theoretical, which was just a few months before. All of a sudden it was so personal. I wanted to know more. I wanted to be able to reach my mom. I wanted to be able to comfort her before she transitioned. After she transitioned, I wanted to contact her, to reach her in that way, to hear from her. Was she okay? So that really propelled me on this journey and made it very concrete and very personal. And that also happened during my, I believe it was my last semester of doing my doctorate. So all of a sudden my intuition kicked in full blown and I woke up with this knowing in one month, my mom is going to cross over. Doctors didn't know it yet. They didn't know what kind of cancer she had, but I woke up with that knowing and it was so strong. And so I couldn't ignore it. It was so there three mornings in a row. And I just booked my ticket and I flew to Israel. That's where my parents were. And I spent this time with my mom and it was life transforming being for her in that way, in a way that her and my dad could not really comprehend as they were very, very atheist, uh, really could not believe in anything. <laughs> I bet your mom feels different about it now. Yes. My mom, who, you know, as I said, it's been 12 years. She transitioned in 2012. Since then has been uh, in communication on and off. Now she's off doing her thing. So she doesn't come through as often. And when she does, it's not as concrete. It's very diffuse. It's very much of a feeling. Before she used to come through more as a person. And that has been changing. Yeah. I was surprised. I've had family members cross over. I'm I was surprised at how accessible they were. Like they're just right there. <laughs> Especially right after they transition, mm -hmm. at least for a few days, they are very present. With my mom, it was so weird. She was like on top of me. She was like being smothering. <laughs> and it just lasted a few days, but it was amazing. She would like answer me in my head. And if I didn't agree with her, she would poke me physically in my finger. And I'm like, mom, what is this? <laughs> and of course, okay. about a week later, it changed and she lifted a little bit. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait, where are you? <laughs> Don't go away. Mm -hmm. So it does yeah. change. But at the beginning, they're very, very present in a very physical way. And as time goes by, they integrate more as spirits. Again, that's from my experience. And they can come through differently in a more etheric way. And sometimes in a clearer way in terms of communication. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that as we expand as a collective and more of us open up to that ability to contact our loved ones that have transitioned, it's such a comfort. It's such a comfort after that, what can be a sad time to realize they're still here. They're just a little different. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you as time goes on, they get a little airy fairy. 
<laughs> you know, they're not as, it's they're true. not as concrete and boots on the ground. They're more conceptual and more just energetic in their presence. Yes. It's more consciousness based and less and less form based. Yeah. Yeah. Which is where we are. It's hard for us sometimes. I know. Exactly. But that is a part of our journey and our evolution. Mm -hmm. And that is a part of a lot of the messages I'm getting that in my channeling, that a part of our evolution is to increase our consciousness. And a part of what that means is increasing our subtle uh, senses. And we need to start paying attention to more and more subtle stimuli. That's a part of how we expand. So it makes sense that as they evolve, as we evolve, everything becomes more consciousness based and less form physical based. Yeah. And I kind of look at it as, oh, how you go through a process of developing any senses. So let's say that you're a big coffee drinker and you start trying different coffees and you develop a taste and you know where this coffee is from and that coffee is from, and you just learn to discern the subtle notes in a cup of coffee. It's the same thing. You learn exactly. to discern the different notes in an energetic field. And if you get, you get to the point where you can just really click in and start interacting with greater frequencies in a different way. I think that's so exciting for humanity that we're going yes. there. Yeah, and I think it's a great analogy because a lot of people don't know how do you know if it's your intuition or just your mind. And like you said, it's a matter of exposure, of practice. Just like if you are not astute in tasting different coffee or different wine, you would just take a sip and yeah, wine is wine. But the more you do it with the intention, intention here is important, to notice the subtle differences, to feel the different textures, different flavors, whatever it is, the more you get better at it, the more you're able to tell the difference. Yeah. I would imagine, you know, 2012 was such a pivotal year here on the planet. That was just kind of when the whole energy shifted. And a lot of people, I, and I was one of them, just squeaked through, you know, very last of 2012, things shifted for me. I had a, a complete different perception. It sounds like it might've been the same for you. It, it must have been a human challenge to stay focused on your degree and your education while you were having this incredible spiritual awakening. How did you navigate that? Yes, it was difficult, especially, like I said, it happened in my last semester. So then I did my internship, which, you know, they work you so hard. And at the same time, during my internship, though, I started practicing hypnosis. So there were all these parallel pro processes happening. On one hand, I was exhausted. My left scientific brain was overworked. On the other hand, my passion towards spirituality was awakening. I discovered hypnosis, which kind of, and I discovered Brian Weiss with past life regression after I was trained clinically in hypnosis. So there are a lot of processes happening at the same time. So it was difficult, but it was also exciting. And one of the most trying moments, it's not just one moment, it's a decision when I graduated with my doctorate in clinical psychology after the everything, it's time to get licensed. And the American Psychological Association does not allow you to practice any spiritual services because then it's as if you're practicing under their license. And not only that, so, so, I, was not, so I had to choose spiritual or clinical and that's after 11 years in school right mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was really difficult and that was a few months of of i guess soul weighing and i decided there's nothing that i would do that would make me happier than follow that spiritual path Oh my and, gosh, that's so good to hear. <laughs> you know, my personality, everything that I'm about, it requires openness and exploration and newness. And the clinical field was closed and was, yeah, closed is really the best way of putting it. So not only they rejected me with my spirituality, which was true, many of my colleagues did not respect me if that's what I was into. But the field as a whole was not willing to accept the reality of consciousness and of spirituality. Yeah. And that was 12 years ago. So I'm hoping that in this 12 years, I know, I just don't know how much, but I'm hoping the field has really transformed 
and that people that graduate today maybe don't have to make the decisions that I had to make. Yeah. So let me clarify. Are you saying that if you had if you had gone for the licensing and opened a practice that you could you could have integrated standard psychology, but they wouldn't allow you to integrate like regression therapy or anything like that? That would not have been... It would not therapy. have been okay. So for regression therapy, when I did my clinical training, they, they instructed, what if clients come to you and ask for past life regression? The answer, you are to tell them there's no such thing. <laughs> oh, you're I kidding. Said, no, no. Now, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't be able to practice past life regression and not be have negative repercussion because nobody would know or nobody would care, but it doesn't mean that it was allowed. Now take that a step further. I want to practice energy work. I want to do readings. Now I'm a channeler. I'm a full-time channeler. They cannot handle that. So let's say they're okay with regression. Now we even have energy psychology. So we're starting to open to that. But I am definitely pushing the envelope farther they're willing to go. 12 years ago, past life regression and energy work was more than they were willing to go. Today, as a channeler, there is no way right. I would be accepted by the American Psychological Association. Yeah. But then, you know, the, the interesting or intriguing thing for me is that what you and I both know, and most of the viewers as well, or they wouldn't be watching this interview, is that that's the reality of our of our system here is past life regression is energy work energy work is much more effective than most traditional medicines in working a patient through an illness so mm -hmm. it's like it's so entertaining to me why do you think and this is just a personal opinion if you don't want to give it that's fine why do you think that it's such a closed system and they're not willing and open to looking at a broader understanding of the human energy field and, and what actually we are as humans. Mm -hmm. I think any large systems take a while to catch up, whether we're talking about laws and rules, whether we're talking about the clinical field, any large system. One, it's often run by the older generation. And two, they only want to endorse what's been proven, <laughs> which means by definition, it's old science, because our reality is always changing. We're always expanding. We're always discovering new. And if um, systems that want to be reliable only consider themselves reliable when they um, base their paradigm on 20, 30, 40 year old science, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, interesting. Well, Tell us about how you how you moved into an alternative practice and how that felt for you and how it worked out for you. Because I think there are probably a lot of people that are going through that same struggle. It's like, wh where do I want to put my energy and my focus? So take us down that journey a little bit. Yeah, so as soon as I graduated, when I knew I was going to go full-blown um, clinical, I actually rented my first office in a crystal shop. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. And that's where I did my counseling and hypnosis. Back then, these were my two services, hypnosis and counseling. And I worked anywhere from little children to older adults, like really the wide span. But the context was spiritual because people that came into the store came to buy crystals or get readings from the owner. So the context was very spiritual, although I was introduced as the clinical person because comparing to everybody else, you know, <laughs> I was the clinical person. <laughs> so that was my start. And I did that for about a year or two. And then it was time for me to get my own office and take my practice to the next level. And that's when I started offering more energy work, readings. Uh, I was doing readings before, but just to friends and family, not professionally. And at that point, when I opened my office, I felt like, okay, it's time to offer that as a part of my offerings. And that's what I did. So that has been a part of my journey. And then COVID hit. So I had my office very happily for several years and then COVID hit. And then everything changed again. And that would be, I think, the next big wave of a consciousness awakening on earth and with myself and for everyone. The world has changed. And I started working from home. 
And I saw it as a huge downgrade and compromise, my beautiful office, my group space. All of a sudden I'm working from home and it wasn't as accepted then. And, you know, I just had people coming into a room in my house. It's so much less impressive than an office. And no, I discovered people loved it. People felt that they're, I'm welcoming into them into my home. My two little friendly dogs were all over them. People were loving it. And then my practice became more and more on Zoom, which kind of working from home anyway. And again, I was very resistant. I did not want to work on Zoom. I did not think hypnosis should be done on Zoom, but my clients really forced me <laughs> because yeah. they embraced that change um, and the comfort of being in their own home while having these sessions. They embraced it much earlier than I did. And that has been my transition business-wise. Now, at the same time, it's interesting how external and internal awakenings happen at the same time. So also at the same time, in 2019, before COVID hit, so again, my interest peaked just a few months before the external glow, as in 2012. In 2019, all of a sudden, I became very interested in channeling. And the, word, the name Lisa Royal Holt, I don't know if you're familiar with her, starts popping up from different directions. And I did not know her. I do not know channelers. I know Seth Speaks. I've loved the material of Seth Speaks, speaks, but that's the extent of it. So her name kept on popping up. And the first person that mentioned her name, I was taking a workshop with him. And he said, I know she is a real channeler. I'm like, ooh, OK. <laughs> I wrote it down. And then her name kept on popping up out of nowhere. And lo and behold, she is a teacher. And I also had the knowing that I'm looking for a teacher. She is a teacher and she teaches channeling, but she doesn't believe in really teaching you channeling. It's all about inner work and inner growth. I'm like, ah, oh, perfect match. I signed up for her channeling group, which was full, but I made it in, of course. And that was the beginning of my channeling journey. Now, I have channeled before, but I wasn't fully sold on it. I know it sounds funny. And of course we can talk about it. I to wasn't totally sold on the idea of channeling. I couldn't tell a hundred percent if I was channeling. So although the reaction from the environment was good, my clients were super happy. The group participants were super happy. I said, mm, maybe not so much. And I took a step back. And then during the channeling training, I jumped full immersion in with the training and with the practice of channeling and with enhancing my psychic abilities even more so and again it was covid there was minimal regular work there was just life was so different and i had so much free time that i could really dedicate myself to that structure to that routine of developing my channeling abilities yeah so let's, because there are people watching right now that are probably interested in channeling, maybe they want to try channeling themselves and they're just, you know, want to know a little bit more about it. Can you tell us or kind of walk us through if you were channeling for your client base before, <clears throat> and then you took this course, what changed, what shifted, how did you expand yourself and what made you feel like, oh, now I'm really clicking in. Mm -hmm. So learning in a group, in a structure, in a class really, really helps. Yes, you can practice with yourself. And in fact, the, the base of psychic development, intuition, spiritual development is inner, is, is with yourself, is your meditation, is your day-to-day -day work becoming an accountable, responsible, joyful individual. And all of that, all that work, right, <laughs> that we do every day, that is all a part of that work. But when you are honing on a specific skill, whether you want to learn to play the piano or you want to begin channeling, having some kind of a structure, a teacher is really, really helpful. And so we'll go back to what I said. So part of it is you. You're learning to trust yourself. You're learning to discern different voices within yourself. You're learning to relax deeply. So I've been meditating daily for um, 13 years now, 
that is a big, big why channeling comes so naturally to me. It wouldn't be the same if I haven't been meditating. I mean, I'm talking an hour long meditation, sometimes longer, using Monroe technology, sometimes silence, all kinds of things. But that ongoing daily work is the groundwork, is the base for everything. Yeah. And then, I tell people med meditation is the gateway drug. It is to everything. <laughs> To, to everything. everything. Yeah, that's when all breath, the freaking breath stuff is <laughs> breath is the best gateway drug and meditation. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, so again, so that plus being in a structured practice. Now I would practice every day or a few times a week with my husband, with other channeling students, eventually with friends, eventually with clients. But that being in that space regularly, making that a part of my learning, a part of, a part of my skill, skill, a part of my routine, that's what made the difference. So I was psychic enough to channel before, but I didn't have the guidance of Lisa, for example, to know that questioning your, the trust that you have within is natural for beginner channelers. I didn't know that. So I just didn't want to compromise my integrity and walked away. So there are a lot of things that you can do, but also you don't need to offer it professionally, right? So walking away and practicing and doing it in a space that's free, that's playful, that's creative, rather than me offering a service that people pay for was a much, much better framework to learn this new skill and get comfortable with it. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I, I think about repeatedly is particularly when I'm working on my own practice or my own spiritual life is Paul Selig has said repeatedly, just do the work, do the work. Don't launch into it and think, oh, this is going to be my business. And so I'm going to learn how to do it. It's do the work first. Do the Absolutely. Work first. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, money is a, is a funny thing, especially when it comes to spirituality and business. And I think one of almost everybody's journey is to know that money is not bad and it's OK to make money. Right. It's OK to have money. It's OK to enjoy money. But at the same time, money cannot be your goal. It really cannot. You cannot open a spiritual business with the intention to make money, with the goal to make money. It's not compatible. It's just not compatible. And there are going to be a lot of conflicts that are going to arise, both internally within yourself and practically. And that's very well said. That's so true. It has to come from the heart. But I think that that's probably true with success in any, it, you know, if you're a craftsman, you've got to love what you do. You've got to love the craft or whatever it is, woodworking or you know, steel work or something like that. You've just got to go into whatever you do in life with a passion for it. And then everything else sort of falls into place because then you're Absolutely. following, you know, you're following your heart, you're following that spiritual guidance. So your practice now is counseling, regression, past life regression, uh, some channeling. For QHHT, those, light oh, language, okay. channeling. Yes. That's what I was going to ask you because there's some people watching that are not familiar with QHHT. Now I'm, I'm a QHHT practitioner. I don't practice anymore. So I do understand it, but for those who don't, it's so powerful. First of all, I just want to say that it will, of all the things that I've been involved in, the information that comes in through a QHHT session is extraordinary. And I have never come across that type of information in another modality. Can you kind of walk people through of what it is and how it works for the human that is involved mm -hmm. in it? Yeah, so modality is the right word for it. QHHT is a modality. It was developed and created by Dolores Cannon. If, if your audience is not familiar with Dolores Cannon, go read her book. She is no longer with us in person, in, phys in the physical. I don't know how many books you wrote, probably 30 something. It's mostly channeled materials through her clients. She developed this modality of hypnosis that is built on past life regression. And after the past life regression, basically, I'm simplifying it, of course, we call the higher self and ask the higher self questions directly. When she started, she called it the subconscious. Later in her career, she referred to it as the higher self, but really interchangeably, they mean the same for the purpose of her modality. And what happens, we, gen, we then bypass the conscious personality and we speak 
we ask the higher self questions directly. And people often have questions about their life purpose, physical ailments, which some amazing things can happen in sessions. And another thing that can happen a lot is different communications, communication with past loved ones, with spirits, with guides, with aspects of your higher self. So that is in very, very brief. And, and why is it a modality? Why is it QHHT? It's actually trademark and Dolores Cannon developed this very specific induction style, very specific script, and that is the QHHT. Now, as a hypnotherapist, as a professional, I don't have to follow her modality or call it QHHD. So you can come and do a passive regression and then we can call your higher self and ask questions. But she was one of the first that came up with it. There were several people that were discovering similar things at the same time, which is, as often happens. But she was one of the first that discovered that you can first do a pretty deep hypnotic uh, trance, induce it without taking hours of inductions. In let's say five to 15 minutes, I would say 99% of people are in sufficiently deep trance to do a past life regression and experience and explore all that they want. Um, well, her husband was actually a hypnotherapist. Okay. And yes, it was not spiritual in any way. And they stumbled upon a past life. And they kept on regressing the person. They didn't know they can ask the person to go for life. So they regressed her another 100 years. Another hundred years. What do you see now? Another hundred years. What do you see now? And that's how it all began. I know. It's such a great story. And she looks like she just won the pie contest at the county fair. <laughs> yes. Just, she's such an accessible, wonderful lady. Of course, she's not in physical anymore, but you can find a ton of her videos here on YouTube. It's um, Dolores Cannon, and she's wonderful. So you are you do past life regressions, and who you you are a channeler, and I that's how I found you. You were channeling a fairy. I just love the whole fairy elementals, that sort of thing. So who are you channeling now? Is, is, is it a specific lineup or is it, does it go back and forth? How does it work for you? Okay. So now my main, main source is the divine feminine Hathor. And when I do light language, Hathor and Isis, and I do have other sources. One of them is Viola the fairy that from my understanding, she is a counterpart of me, of Yafi. And um, she actually appeared to me uh, the time before last that I was at the Monroe Institute. She revealed herself to me. And then a couple of months later, I was, I built up enough courage to call her and channel her because I felt that's where it was going to my little Sunday group. And indeed I channeled her and that was maybe a year or two ago. So I've, I've had a long relationship with her of course, longer, but as a channeler, and I have many, many others. So in my book, Conversations with the Earth, I document the beginning of my journey as a channeler. And as common for new channelers, and as was recommended to us, it was a little bit of a revolving door, calling different consciousnesses, different intelligences. So the Pleiadians and the Syrians and earth elements and any loving, expanded intelligence that was willing to communicate with me and my group. And there was a lot of experimentation and exploration. And Hathor was one of the first, first that came through. But back then, so she's in the first book, but back then I didn't know that that was going to become my main, main source, this long standing relationship that was going to become such a intertwining with my own essence in such a profound way. So I would say she is my main source today, Hathor. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, through me, she comes at the pathway of the divine feminine. And um, yeah, any questions? <laughs> yes, actually I do. So you channel a number of different entities. And I right. know that some people will start in with a particular entity and which kind of primes them and preps them for the next, you know, for, mm -hmm. for maybe an energy system that's a little much for them in the beginning. So they kind of, you know, work their way into it. It's kind of like moving up in weights at the gym. You know, mm -hmm. you start with the 10 yes. pound and, and, and move up to the 20 because the 20 would be too much in the beginning. Can you, when you're going into a channeling session, are, do you know, do you ask to channel a, a certain person? Do, do you get surprise visits? 
how does that work? Because those people who don't channel, it seems kind of foreign to them or they don't really mm-hmm. understand it. Can you kind of walk us through how it works for you? I know everybody's different, but share your mm-hmm. process with us. Absolutely. So when I am about to channel, so first of all, especially at the beginning, but even now we would agree upon in, in advance, who would, do we want to call? Or we, we would allow the presence to announce to us through cards. So we could pull from a deck of card a card, and this is the essence that wants to come through. So we would call that essence. So that would be stage one. So I would close my eyes, go inward, take a deep breath to relax and say my invocation. I used to say it out loud. Then I I switch to saying it inside, which is about putting myself in this expansive light space and then inviting them and calling them now. And that would be my process. And so who would come through would be the closest essence that responds to my call the closest compatibility that is available. And that is how it's been from the beginning. So for example, one day we were very interested, uh, curious about the Zetas and the hybridization program. So I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's call the hybrid children. (laughs) So (laughs) that's in the book. It's probably the wildest chapter. So, okay. So I went inward and I called the hybrid children or anyone involved with the program and I did my thing. And then a caregiver came through and she said, yes, we're selecting an individual is being selected. And then an individual that named himself Alonzo came through and he was telling, answering our questions. Again, the group, I'm with my eyes closed channeling and the group members are asking questions and they were interviewing Alonzo about the hybridization program and what they do and how they see people and what they do for fun and so forth and so forth. So yes to both. I call on an essence, but yes, sometimes they do surprise us to a degree. It's not going to be completely different unless they have a really interesting plan in store because I, it is an interaction it is me opening and them integrating with me so there is yeah. a back and forth is definitely part of it what i'm opening what i'm calling but also what they're sending now yeah. another thing you mentioned about how there is a preparation as the energies get more intense so a part of it was the exploration, right? Open to different energies, interview different energies, experience different essences. So that is a part of the preparation. But additionally, what's been happening with Hathor, that you could say it's the same essence, but more and more layers are being revealed, both more intense energetically, more deep in terms of the material that comes through, and more and more physical, which is one of the latest development uh, earlier this year, they have announced through me that they are again on earth in the physical. And I've been having more and more physical sighting. And also people around me are experiencing different things. So there's definitely a preparation to integrate it fully into the physical. Wow, that's really interesting. So it sounds like what you could say is the curriculum is getting more advanced. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. So when you say the physical, does that mean that Hathor is in embodied in a human body? I don't think human, but yes, um, they have. So just so the name Hathor, we actually know the name Hathor from ancient Egypt. When she was a, a Isis was a priestess and a goddess. Hathor was a goddess and she had different forms as a goddess and different functions as a goddess. But the mythology and from what they're saying, the reality, they actually walk the earth in the physical. So now again, them and what they are is a good question. I don't think humans, but what they are is a good question. They are in the physical on earth again. Uh, I'm quoting them in a secure location, so there are no uh, interference with their activities. And they're here anchoring certain energies and also uh, doing things. They are, you would say, intervening, but not in the intrusive way. Uh, They're helping. They're helping in any way that they can, energetically, consciously, physically. Yeah, and we need it. (laughs) We need it right now. Things are really goofy on the planet. Well, would you like to do some channeling? Is that a 
a comfortable sure. thing to say about you? Sure. Now, would you like me to call Hathor or Viola? So Viola is the fairy and Hathor mm -hmm. is the divine feminine. You know, I think I originally was going to say the fairy, but I think I want to speak with Hathor. Maybe you can come back and we can do the fairy in another video because I'd love to speak to an animal, elemental. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I'm pretty quick. So I'm just going to take a, a deep breath and go inward. And Hathor should be here momentarily. <laughs> okay, thank you. Blessings. Oh, welcome in. I could feel you come in on my side too. So thank you for your time today. It is our pleasure to be here. And we will say that we have a wide variety of entities available to communicate with you. So you may, as you wish, play around and ask different questions, seeing which entity would come through to answer. Okay, thank you. You know, the first place I want to start is kind of the wild show that's going on on planet Earth right now. I know that we're a focus for a lot of energy around the universe. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the transition that's happening on the planet and how you're participating in it? Yes. One of the most interesting aspects about the Earth reality show at this time is that the show is very different depending on who is watching and experiencing it. So currently, there are many, many shows happening at the same time, and different people are convinced that their show is what is happening. Now, our show then would be relative to who we are communicating with. Our perspective will look different on the whole of humanity, depending who we are interacting with. So we will say that from our perspective, your reality show is definitely getting more and more interesting. And our role within it is not present in all the shows. So there are different shows, different realities, different experiences. Now, let us go to the consensus reality of this channeler and the ones around her. Right now, you are included in this pool of beings. Right now, your Earth is going through a very exciting transition, and yes, you see a lot of things happening. You called it goofy. And we will say goofy may be a good word for it because it adds lightness and laughter. And we will say, yes, there is a lot of pain. Yes, there is a lot of suffering. But at the same love, at the same time, there is love growing. There is transformation actively taking place there is awakening there is connection and communion worldwide like never before all these processes are happening in our present now so yes there is a lot happening a lot bubbling on your planet earth right now However, it is not a negative skewed experience as some would tend to think or believe. Okay, so I want to try to understand, and I realize I'm coming at this from with a human brain. <laughs> and I, I understand there's a, you know, the human brain is a filter and it filters out a lot of information. And so perhaps sometimes the human ability to understand complex systems is a, can be a little limited and, and limit more limited than yours. So when you say there are a lot of different perceptions happening on the planet, in other words, this group is, is perceiving this, this group is perceiving this. Is it just a difference? Individual, in, not groups. Okay. So is, 
would that be different timelines or would it just be different filters? I'm still trying to understand the multiple timelines and how we can all be in the same reality system on the same planet, but perhaps we're on different timelines. So we're seeing different events. Can you help me understand that a little better? I will do my best. Yes. So you said a lot here. So you, you understand that each individual, yes, it's true for groups, but the individual is the smallest unit has a filter. The brain is a filter. The personality is a filter. So this filter actually shapes the reality you are in. So it is not just a perception that is detached from the nature of reality, but it actually constructs your reality. So that is one point. Now you validly ask, well, if we're all living infinite different realities, how come I look around and all these people are around me? How are we sharing the same space? And we will say there is a constant interweaving of all the consciousnesses that makes out this reality, this earth, this universe. So there's a constant weaving and interaction. Nothing is static. So it's not like you are in this reality, Yafi is in this reality, and here you shall stay. This is not the case. It is always moving, it's always in motion, everything is always fluid, but you're intertwining and constantly. And every time you look around, who you see around you, what you experience is your current intertwinement, your current experience. So one of the things that is, I could say upsetting, but maybe it's just challenging in my world right now, is that I... I feel like we've had a loss of consensus on the planet. In other words, I can understand a situation in one particular way and then meet or talk to someone who sees it completely different, which can, it's unsettling to me that on the planet, we don't seem to have much of a consensus. Whereas I, I think that we used to, but maybe that was just my perception. The question I'm wondering is, is this, particular to earth and the, and the energies that we're moving through. So do other civilizations, do they have more of a consensus than we do, or is this particular to earth and what we're going through? Can you just speak to that? It's, it's yes. unsettling as a human. So to feel one, like, go ahead. Thank you. One, be comforted to know that if you share the same, the fact that you can speak to that person and they can speak to you, that means you share some of the consensus reality. So they are not as far removed as you would think, despite the seeming gap in cognition or however you would like to see it um, in, in being. There's a gap there, lack of awakening, or there's a gap so despite the gap, there's also a connection. If not, your reality would not overlap. So that is one. Now two, also hopefully find comfort in the fact that this, we would say journey of polarity and polarization is not unique to humans. Not only it is not unique to humans, it is an integral part of growth and of change and you cannot have a transformation without having this kind of separation. Oh, okay. Can you speak more to that? Yes, absolutely. So consciousness right now is in an acceleration of expansion, as you know. So that means that everything that has to be explored, everything that has to be experienced, anything that has to be realized has to come to the surface, has to experience right now. So you're seeing all these bubbles coming up to the surface to be experienced. Any polarity that was swept under the rug must now bubble up and surface and be expressed. And that means also being seen. So you're going to see, and of course, not only you, 
different expressions of polarity that is coming up to the surface so it can then be resolved. And the majority of the resolution will be towards openness and communion and connection as this is the general direction. The more you expand out, the more you zoom out, the more integration is the general connection, the general direction. The more you zoom in on specific instances and specific people, you see where they are on their specific journey, in their specific role that they're playing for the population as a whole. Okay. Here's a question I have, and this, this kind of makes me a little crazy as a human. <laughs> And that is, is that I understand clearly that we create our reality. We get that. As a human, it's hard to wrap our brains around that whole thing. And I I, I realize once I transition out of this body, it's going to be probably easier to understand. So what I'm wondering is, if I create my own reality, then why do things pop up in my reality that I don't prefer that I never even could have dreamed up of because they never crossed my mind. And I'll give you an example. Let's say COVID. We, you know, in my reality, the uh, the people I talked to, we all experienced COVID. Some of us did some things with it. Some of us did other things. How we handled it was a different topic. But I never even would have thought of something like COVID. It just never crossed my mind. And yet I experienced it. So how is that possible if I'm creating my own reality? How could I create something that I at -hmm. least consciously would never even have thought of? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you are creating your reality is true on different levels. And on the narrow level that you are talking about, Kimberly is creating her reality in a much more, we would say, moment to moment uh, way. Now, if you realize that Kimberly has layer of consciousness, as we were talking about the higher self and the subconscious, as you go into the layer of consciousness, the more awareness there is. Consciousness and awareness are very related. So if you then go to Kimberly's higher self and ask her about COVID, you would get a different answer than you would ask physical Kimberly. Yes? Yes. And higher self Kimberly knew all about COVID and was looking forward to the trip humanity was going to have during that time. Okay, well, I need to have a conversation then with my higher self, apparently. (laughs) You do all the time. (laughs) And you know, it's interesting that you say that, that my higher self would be excited about an event like that, because when I look back, I think that although most humans might say that was not a pleasant thing to go through, I would say that most humans, if they were being honest, would say I experienced an enormous amount of personal growth. Yes, and you see it on yourself, the levels of strengthening. And what we see for you is, it's difficult to describe, it's as if your um, identity is made out of layers, those layers became thicker, stronger, you grew furthermore into your personality, into your personhood, into your strength, into, when we say into your personhood, we also means finding and reiterating what you truly love, what you truly want. So these layers have become thicker and stronger. And yes, you knew in a higher perspective that this was coming and happening. And indeed, you were excited about it. You are similarly to this vehicle here, quite an explorer, quite, quite an adventurer. You like adventures. You like the opportunities for growth. Yeah, that's true. I do. So what you're saying then is the different layers of us with broader perception and a broader view are working out experiences that is going to help us grow, that will help us grow in this physical form, in, a, in the smaller arena that we're, we're in on earth. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. That is correct. We'll just add another little piece of information. 
that these layers are not separate from you. You are an extension of these layers, just as these layers are extensions of you. So although you may not always be aware of it, your desires are not separate. Your goals are not separate. An example would be if this little finger, this pinky, does not have the awareness the brain has or that Yafi has. It does not know that it's reaching for this bottle of water to hold the water to drink. It does not understand hydration. It does not understand the energy that is running through this vehicle right now, but it does understand its function. It knows to grasp the bottle. It has, in a way, its own function and its own will. It can get hurt. It can feel well. It can grow nails etc etc you are in this analogy the pinky finger of your whole being you are not separate from it your desires are not separate although you are aware of what you can be aware you know what you can know yeah oh that was beautifully put thank you really well said because i got it <laughs> and i appreciate that all right the last question i have before we bring yafi back is and this is a personal I'm going to share personally, and I think some of the viewers might be be feeling similar to what I'm going to express, is that there is so many challenges on the planet right now. It can be a little heartbreaking from a human standpoint. It can it can feel tough. It can and there's some days that I just think, oh my gosh, you know, I can't do this anymore. It's to get it's getting crazy. What can you share with us as a good guidelines or good practices or good perceptions that we can integrate in order to really take advantage of the learning that we're, we're going through and also do it in a way that's going to feel more comfortable? Yes, yes. We will say that there is a lot happening around you. Some of it is directly directed as at you and some of it is not. We would suggest to, especially when feeling overwhelmed with the environment, to find a way to detach from the madness, to detach from the upheaval and go inward. And this, yes, it can mean meditation, but it can also mean a walk in nature. It can also mean listening to music, it can also mean cuddling with a beloved pet. Going back to your physical, to your here and now, to your safety within is essential. That's one. We'll go with two. This is a message that we know you've heard again and again, and you will continue hearing it again and again and again. You are not alone. You are loved. You are supported. If we talk about layers, imagine that at any given moment, you are wrapped around by layers and layers and layers and layers of love and support and guidance and more light and more love and more hugs and more empowerment and more support. And that's how it goes. Yes. You do not need to think about it as spirits invading your privacy all the time, but layers of love and guidance that are always ever present and that are not separated from your own essence and your own identity. So even when you feel alone or low or overwhelmed or overwhelmed by emotions such as sadness or anger, or despair, remember that this is your current moment. And in the bigger, expansive picture, you are surrounded by all these loving layers that are just here to love you. That was beautifully put. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope we can talk again in the future. That would be lovely. I'm sure we will. All right. Thank you.
And she's back. Ah, and I'm back. <laughs> oh, goodness. Deep breath. <sighs> I get yeah. very hot channeling. You do. Interesting. It yes, must be always. that the increased energy. I think so. System. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was so beautiful. I wish you could have been here for it. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely. Now, when you channel like that, is it do you have any memory of it or is it just kind of wispy and sort of fades away or how does that work for you? It's, it's tricky because during I convinced that I'm fully present and I'm fully here because I'm there in the background. So I'm like, yes, I'm here. I used to not realize how much I'm not here. And then when I come back, I think maybe for the first second, it seems like it's all available. And then it becomes almost like waking up from a dream. Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. ask me about specific things, or if I think about specific things, it's relatively easy to retrieve the information almost always. There are exceptions, but almost always. Also, my eyes water when I channel. Yeah. Um, so I can retrieve the information, but it is wispy. But it's kind of tricky. It's elusive because sometimes it feels like the memory is really solid. And then I'm like, yes, we were talking about. And all of a sudden, I'm shocked to realize that I it's blank. I need some something to trigger a question. I'm like, oh, of course, that question. And then, mm -hmm. by the way, sometimes I remember more things that did not come through the channeling. So with my Sunday group, for example, sometimes we, we used to do it more than we do now. We talk about the questions and answers that came up because sometimes I'm like, oh, yes, they were showing me this or, or they could also go in this direction, but it never came through because they were talking, they went in a different direction. Yeah. So sometimes there's actually extra knowledge that, that is there once it's triggered. Yeah. And I think that that's such a good point you brought up. When you're accessing that type of information, there's so much more information that can be placed into the awareness field than we can, like in a, in a nanosecond, you can get so much information. It would be so hard to, to talk that through. Exactly. Emotions and visuals yes. and sensations. Absolutely. Yeah. And so those of you who are watching, who would like to learn to channel, or that's really interesting, it becomes fascinated because of what you can access. And there's so much inter in, you know, information out in the world. I wish I knew all of it. I met you do too sometimes. <laughs> We're trying. We're doing our best. <laughs> We're doing our very best. This was so wonderful. Now, physically, how do you feel when you're channeling? Is it energizing? Does it wear you out? Is it just, you know, mm -hmm. normal? How does it work for you? Well, as I said, my temperature goes up and it happens before I start channeling. So as soon as they're here, I guess, I don't know, that's our word. It's our human word. As soon as they're here, they're always here. They keep on saying that. But as soon as these channels start opening energetically, I start getting really hot and I start sweating and I'm not a sweating kind of person, but I start sweating and I start getting really hot. And then during, as I said, I take an, like a breath and I go inward and I kind of get really comfortable. And it's kind of a combination of being really relaxed. Like I remove my attention completely away from my physical. So I have zero, very little awareness of what my body is doing during the channeling. Cause I go inward. Um, so I'm relaxed, but I'm also very focused. So it's not just la la. <laughs> it's very, very focused on keeping with the transmission and keeping clear. It's almost like when I was a new channeler, they gave me this analogy I love of a juggler. So channeling is like inside, we're like juggling balls. And one ball is our own thoughts. Another ball is our own emotion. Another ball is the specific reaction that we had. Another ball is the consciousness that is coming through. Another ball is the keeping clear. They didn't say all of that. I'm just giving us balls apparently according to the metaphor, we're juggling 10 balls now. No, but the idea that we're juggling balls and as the channeler, it's up to you to juggle all the ball to make sure that they don't collide and that it continues moving smoothly. So that yeah. all of that is somehow happening inside. So that's where the focus comes in. But the focus is not about what I'm going to say next. That's the difference. The focus is on 
maintaining that clarity and that openness and not interfering in any way. Yeah, hence the important of importance of meditation Absolutely. for channeling because it, it gives you that focus and that ability to just go into that quiet place. Wonderful. Well, this has been absolutely fabulous. I hope you'll come back and see us again. I would love to learn more, maybe bring in the the fairy yeah. next time. That would absolutely. Be that would be lovely. How do we find out more about you? That's my website. It's really easy. I don't do too much social media, but I do have a website, yafichanneling.com. I'm also on YouTube where I have many, 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 many videos and you can see the channelings, light language, interviews, different things. I'm also on Facebook, just my name, Yafi Yair. I have this book out, Conversations with the Earth. I also teach light language, which is a wonderful way to introduce yourself to channeling. So the way I teach light language is I teach you to be an open channel, and then I teach you to express it with your voice, to use your voice and express it that way. So it is an introduction to channeling the way I see it. And it's a really beautiful class. I really recommend it to anyone who is interested. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thanks. And we'll see you again sometime soon. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Coming up next, this is a good one. Or you might really like this one, too. Either one of them could be perfect for you. Before you leave, don't forget to subscribe.